Welcome back everyone for cloud computing and big data. Today we have our short lecture 15, which is about big data streaming tools and applications. It's another short lecture really to provide pointers, to provide links to additional material on top of the cloud computing course, essential materials. It's just a short lecture to really get you some ideas what are big other topics to study. The last time we had, if you remember, the short lecture 14, which was exactly also basically in the same character. So there we lay, we actually learned what online social networking means, um, that this is underpinned by so-called graph databases, which share interesting characteristics. They have a very interesting performance um, dealing with large data sets. They have a very interesting performance when you think about the, the really unhomogeneous setup of all this data. And, and this is, I think, best represented by this kind of interesting graphic here. So you would have to think that, of course, um, there are lots of small data around. We talk about this big data, but if you look into this big data um, that is basically created by all of these different social media activities, and it's really activities, Right, it's not this typical table character which says um, you always have to have a name, an address, a telephone number, social security number, whatever it is. Um, here we're talking about content. Some share more videos, some not. Some share short videos, some short long videos. Um, in Twitter, some people are very silent and just want to see what others tweet. In other accounts, Twitters are really active tweeting every day. So you will come to a situation where basically the big data characterized by this single pillar here is essentially looking like that. So it's growing in all sorts of directions. It's very unhomogeneous. It's hard to predict where actually the next content will follow. And to really interlink all of this content, as we know from the online social networks like Facebook or YouTube and so on, um, and we have seen also the influencers making use of Twitter, of, you know, tags to really get the followers, to really get the likes and so on, um, and interlink really content, which is a key idea of all of this, um, is really something which is, is very unstructured. It's really hard to predict. And with this, the graph net databases is, are just beautiful for this to really understand this growing behavior these relationships really between entities on the one side, which could be persons, companies, pages, videos, and then the relationships really with others could be liking, could be uh, many other things. Um, and of course, also thinking about this graph traversal that we discussed the last time, you would be not interested always to see, okay, I like that. You also as a liked you know, content, so to speak, you want to know and directly see that. So this graph traversal has both directions if you want. An example that I provided to you was a Facebook graph. Of course, here it's interesting to store the likes, but always think about for graph traversal. And it's very nice if you want to have, let's say some content to really see directly how many people really liked it. So in a way it makes also sense to have this bi-directional idea and this is something what uh, you know graphics graphs are really good in and facebook is just one example i showed you this tau graph database and you can immediately make the connection when you use facebook how that internally looks like with all the entities with the events with ids of users um, you know locations names and whatnot so in the end all of these little details um, play a big role in interconnecting all this notes versus basically content that is provided. And by putting it into relationships with each other, of course, Facebook learns from this. And in the same way, also Google learns basically from the search queries, let's say we put in, that's something we are interested in. And the same way Facebook learns for what we like, um, you know, all of our other characteristics, the locations we have been regularly, are we big travelers or are we rather staying at home? Are we, you know, providing lots of content or are we silent, don't provide our name and just want to listen on the conversation of others? So this is something which is, let's say, 
very characterized by this interesting graph that I said looks a little bit like this, you know, and then basically if you look into the subgraph character, um, where some of those are very sparse of the subgraph, so basically this is a friendships of friends that maybe don't share much, but then you have this very dense networks interconnect with everything and then maybe connecting to another dense network connected to everything just by one single entity relationship here. Um, this is characterizing big data in a very, let's say, inhomogeneous and, and structured way. And you know, all of those social networking sites have to deal with this. So they have to work with this and using the cloud essentially for dealing with this kind of um, unpredictable character and thus need the scaling up, scaling down that we have discussed now numerous times in the course, just to give you pointers again, that of course, online social network these days is a very interesting element to study. <clears throat> then of course, the other big topic would be graph databases to study because they are, let's say, not only relevant for online social networking, you can find them in many different application areas. One example was of course, a tracking of you know, infected patients in COVID-19, which is a, immediately a graph, how people interact with each other. But the second part was then uh, more or less, um, you know, what what is basically in it? If you have the data, so how actually doing these sites really a return of investment over time? And we come to the big advertising world and marketing world. It is just one point of view where I said today is essentially even online social networking, a, a job profile. You can be social media manager of a company or a product, whatever it is. So in the end, talking about that, in, although you may be enrolled at all of these for free, you know, LinkedIn is for free, Twitter is for free, YouTube is for free, Facebook is for free, and they can go on and go on. Of course, you sign in for free, but always have in mind that, of course, this for free means you share the graph, your interactions with the content with those providers. And that's their gold. And with this gold, they learn from you. They are actually able to provide so-called targeting or personalized advertising. And this is, of course, something brilliant for companies, right? Instead of wasting money to put ads to people that have no idea about and no interest in this product, they can have now a very interested targeting audience for their ads. And, and the way how it works is, for instance, using Google Ads. And I mean, Google Ads today would fill seminars and you can have certifications of Google Ads, a complete three days, how to improve Google Ads and how to be the perfect social media manager and you know, put things out as Google Ads to also earn revenues. But essentially, we are talking about filling the ads here from Google with some content of your company. That's where Google Ads is for. And uh, to, you see that when you search in the Google search engine, you will be ranked there somewhere. Um, and of course, this is depending on the keywords that you choose. So Google Ads has a very nice integrated key tool finder that searches basically on all the, the search strings um, when, and then gives you also the estimated way how people, you know, use that kind of string. So you get an average of the monthly searches, for instance. And this can be particularly well-tuned to your ads. So there's a very naive thinking of all of us and also of the marketing experts and everyone to think about that is what people maybe you know, search about my product. And, and the interesting thing is if you go to Google Ads, you get perspective. You get a, let's say, interesting objective way of how you basically um, are searched for, right, as a product. So many people then would put the advertising of saying this and this sentence, but if you put it in, nobody's really searching for that. So the interesting thing is of go using Google Ads for this and even if it's just the key tool finder to optimize the content of your web page, the optimize the content of your YouTube channel, this is all something where this Google key tool is really an interesting subject to, st to really to study. study. Um, very similar is the YouTube um, advertising that you can mention. I mean, basically you see that here. Um, you have seen that many times, I'm sure if you use YouTube a lot, 
there's this kind of advertising. If you buy YouTube Premium, then this advertising is gone, okay? Again, you know, it's a return of investment. Uh, brilliantly, basically from the same company, converted into another return of investment, which is then, of course, having a YouTube Premium subscription. So you see how smart these online social networking activities and providers uh, are really working with this content with the different ideas of how they can, you know, get return of investment of their uh, kind of, um, you know, content and so on. And then, of course, appropriately sharing it with the community. So uh, we also were talking about that YouTube and then sharing it um, here and there. You get actually also some sense from that. And if you have match content, but of course, Google likes, then you are basically getting more profits out of it. Then the other way around is, you know, putting ads here and there in establishing, you know, this basically somewhere in, in established online social networks like Facebook. So you can buy their ads. Of course, another return of investment for, uh, you know, companies like Facebook, where you can then nicely point to your website. Here's an example of this big data tips I did last time, you know, and then the interesting thing is this is one revenue stream where you say, okay, you have to pay the price for it and you essentially pay 10 euros maybe here as a total budget per week to two euros per day. But the interesting thing is you get maybe much more people going to your website. And then, of course, your website doesn't end. Usually you're smart enough to integrate all of these content and ads in your page. And then we talk about the other side. Now you are the host of the ad. Now are you basically talking about Google AdSense? So you have your own page and you allow everyone basically to basically put ads on your page. But of course, Google is smart enough to put it not to everyone, but those which have products which fits the keywords to your page. And with this, you can really steer the content of Google AdSense and again, earn money. Of course, with this now, People use your web page size and space for their own product marketing. But this is good for you because in Google AdSense, you can return, you know, get some revenues out of it. While in Google Ads, you have to put money to get your product known, to get it very high up in searches, to be actually found. Google AdSense is the other way around, where you basically earn money that other people put their products up to your content. So here's a big data page is a very good example for our course because it puts, of course, then things which have no relationship with the page itself, like Tableau is a big product here. And it's basically putting the marketing right in, ton, in, in front of your page. But because of what? You basically have actually sold that space to Google AdSense by providing their frame that directly links to Google AdSense. And that's how it operates. So there's something in for people providing content. The more content you provide, the more revenues you get. And of course, an influencer you can imagine now lives from the content. It basically provides contents again and again. Um, you have seen this also basically with people doing it very successfully, just traveling around the world, doing very good high quality videos from Santorini, from Crete, from wherever you go in the world. And then you share that on your YouTube channel and many people watch that because it's so popular. It's so nice to see that. And by doing so, it's it's a different form of influencer, really. They do a lot of revenues. But of course, they influence the people to, to think about this as vacation scenarios. So the hotels are even maybe giving them a free stay over just to make very good drone movies from Santorini. Maybe if you know a little bit of Santorini on the cliffs, you can imagine uh, what that means. And then suddenly... You have lots of people following it, looking on it on YouTube. And the interesting thing is those influencers then can use these revenue channels that I just explained here on their websites or basically directly via the YouTube, you know, marketing that you get here um, back in their own pockets. And that's nowadays, interestingly enough, <laughs> a job profile, an influencer, as we have seen from the last Pringles and Singles video from Lecture 14. But let's go to lecture 15, which is now really the last conceptual lecture I really want to point out here. Just because big data streaming is really on vogue, 
it is a big topic. We need a complete course to understand it properly. We will go, let's say, a little bit quick through this to give you just appetizers and pointers why that's important, what tools are actually eminent there in the space. And then we have a very nice uh, video summarizing that in, in my respect, although it's a bit longer, but still very interesting to, to look because also Icelandic volcanoes are in and it's a bit scientific. So data streaming tools and, you know, all of these areas where we have said in the beginning of the course, sometimes the problem with big data is not 20 petabytes. We maybe can digest this, but if this, you know, petabytes, your pair 20 seconds come in and it never stops, then we are in trouble. So this is something where streaming applications in the future with better sensors, you have seen maybe Sentinel-6, if you're a little bit in earth sciences and, you know, satellite, there's a new, you know, Sentinel-6, which gives you lots of interesting big data, better sensors, better data, big data. Just an example that we will face a future where we are overwhelmed with data. And some of you will probably notice this already when you are actually active in all the different social media sites and basically uh, then have lots of other content to follow. It's, it's just enormous material we already face today. And the future will be much more richer, much more fully interconnected. So we can live in a world where we have to analyze the data streams uh, with some applications that maybe know you a little bit like, you know, analytics on this. So what's what's really important? What's not important? Maybe interactive access. So thinking about can I steer, can I filter it in my ways and perhaps interactively to just, you know, thinking about my my situation right now. Can I have visual representatives of all that data because I'm overwhelmed? People talk about there many times about so-called infographics, for instance, having lots of lots of statistics of data, analytics of data, of big data shown in one actually interesting figure. Then you go on and think about tools. So what tools are out there? And of course, we come back to Apache Spark, what we had at the beginning of the course as a fundamental tool. Of course, we also talked at that time, there's a streaming library that you can use. It's open source. And as we know, it's basically deployed usually on MS Azure, AWS, and Google Cloud platforms. So you immediately can use it also in the cloud providers. There's a very specific service in AWS Kinesis I would basically go quickly into, and then we'll go back to all the open source um, products and basically open source tools that are available there. And here and there do some social media examples, of course. Um, again, we think reflecting on the cloud um, and reflecting on Spark and what we discussed, sometimes the hardware matters, even if you have a very high level software as a service approach, but he would talk about in-memory approaches and libraries, then a little bit of more bigger workflows to Apache Kafka. And basically another big topic would be, especially for machine learning, this online learning approach. And, and this is something which of course requires maybe three to four lectures to really fully understand. But here we talk about that the stream of data now, of course, enables us to continuously learn from data on the fly we don't have this static training and you know testing set that we know from previous lectures from us. Here we talk about a constant stream of data, how I handle this, how I work with this, and when I want to do it directly machine learning models out of it. It's a big topic called online learning, um, and we will put it into the context of our data streaming examples. So firstly, understanding data streams, uh, it's pretty obvious that there were web actions, you know, everything you do um, with a data stream, you like some things in social media. Then you would have um, data streams of measurement devices very early on in the course, we had already this one petabyte per 20 seconds or so from the SKA square kilometer array, which has really measured data. And in one respect, you can also see all the applications, the HPC and HTC simulations you do from astrophysics, from computational fluid dynamics, avalanches, which is, let's say, some threat for Iceland, is very well understood in this area with open foam simulations. We do more in the HPC course, but basically these are all data sources as well. So there are different streams of data. 
And now what we also can characterize here as a conceptual view of this is um, you have this data things. So there's this data sources we just discussed and the data things that give you maybe a dashboard of sorts, which trains a machine learning model to understand if the measuring device is something found very new, which we can classify as something new, or basically visualizations, which are maybe interactive, where you can here, for instance, steer the location of the black hole and then change the interaction with the stars around it. Also, from the conceptual perspective here, one of our key considerations would be, what if? What if I can you know, filter this information out? If I can reduce the amount of information of sorts? You see here, N optional filters are in the streams defined as something where we maybe can you know, go into this data stream and do something with it. It could be many forms, um, could be just picking out certain events which really matter for us, while others maybe are unimportant. And these are really important factors to consider, especially in big data, because chances are in the future, we cannot keep all the data anymore that is coming up from all these different simulations. And more or less very popular these days are also new types of data streams where you said we, as a user, put ourselves in the shoes of being a data provider. And I think the online social networking um, was exactly that in a way, if you think about it. So here we're talking about that we create, of course, lots of data streams. And when you now think about, let's say you're a scientist, and then there were basically usual citizens that are the so-called citizen scientists, which is a term which actually gets more momentum these days because we scientists are very, very rare in, in numbers. The general population of the Earth is, of course, much more richer. And the knowledge of these people is, of course, tremendously important also. But, of course, it gives you, let's say, in some areas where you need specialized knowledge, perhaps a little bit of low trust, but still it gives you... I mean, exabytes of, you know, valuable information, perhaps. And with this, you have different streams here. We would say maybe some of those from the large populations are really hobby, you know, having certain topics, you know, maybe flowers and then making pictures of that in their hobby, which can inform some biologist or flower specialist um, for some kind of data. Of course, you would have always moderate trust in the data in this because it's not still the domain experts, but the sheer amount of information perhaps helps even those which are, let's say here, really the key experts. But you immediately see from the figures on the right hand side, the, the practice in all of this is that the general population is rich. People that know something about specific topics very well are existing, but then the experts of the experts that know almost everything in this field are incredibly rare in our population. So in this sense, um, this is something called crowdsourcing where you try to get the more general population or to the, the, the larger audience really to help your cause to really support here the scientific community as an example, but you have to see him basically already perhaps heard about movies that people actually engaging in crowdsourcing of movie crowdfunding and so on. So this is an interesting new type of data stream that comes in. Also unpredictable, you never know who actually participates, um, which is another factor in this, but still very valuable if you think about the sheer amount of data that you can get, get by all of these people. And the challenges, of course, with this, as I said, there's this moderate trust in the data. And trust is a very important word when it comes to data. Um, the quality control that goes with it um, also has a big impact on, on real content that you get out of this. I mean, we are in the end want to do something with the data streams. In one way or another, we maybe want to do machine learning models and learn something out of these data streams. We just don't look at it for fun, right? We want to do something. Sentiment analysis, does, does someone like my product or not? When I have low trust in data, then we would call that perhaps a little bit like rubbish in the end. And then you put that in a classifier for machine learning and we call that rubbish in, rubbish out. So the trust in the data, the quality of the data matters. And here I'm not necessarily always talking about the features need to be you know, well chosen. I'm talking about is the data correct? Is this really correctly annotated? Are there many missing values uh, and so forth? Um, this is a big topic in machine learning 
this is a big topic in data streams where basically lots of time goes into preparing, pre-processing the data, ensuring the quality is right. And um, this is, of course, something which is in, in all sorts of streams existing. So you would have error prone measurements of, you know, basically sensor devices. You have the wrong, let's say, annotations from humans on data. And because it's so high volume and high velocity at the same time, this is a big challenge. And of course, here, cloud computing again comes to the rescue, um, has, of course, capacity uh, from terms of storage and then also basically the capability for computing to really work on these streams in almost real time. And now the the other part of this is um, now when you think about how we would put that in the light of content we discussed earlier, when you think about this persistent identifiers, it has more challenges than one. So here we talked about quality. Now here, if you want to do a data stream persistent, it is actually an oxymoron. <laughs> so basically you would say the data stream that we have here with some measurement data, you want to basically cite in a publication. But as this measurement device is continuously having the measurement device stream, um, our concepts that we have from the EOS cloud, if you remember, with B2 share getting a persistent identifier um, on this data set on this is, is relatively hard. So how do you reference really a real time data stream that always comes in? And can we update unfinished data sets? So you don't want to have a big publications on some unfinished data set. Um, and what about missing values in the future? So this is something where, you know, this PID assignments is quite challenging and shows you again that this big data streams is really a big subject to study. And of course, it has also be remarkable ideas and enormous insights. So the uh, sheer idea of having something real time understood in the stream is, of course, very interesting. You can have, you know, things directly uh, maybe interacting with. Um, I'm talking here about more real time analytics. You can maybe steer back things that happening. When you think about here your web actions, when you would have this continually data hidden in the log and you do analytics and so on, you immediately see, well, one of these pages is not really used. So you change the parameter on the web application. In other words, um, somewhere the content will be changed or things like that. Um, and you immediately go back to the data stream and change it, right? And this is an interesting interactive access um, character of those things where those interactive access enables you to give some action and have a response, give some action and having a response. The same is true with measurement devices. When you think about they measure data in a certain way, and then you would say that uh, actually my classifier cannot really handle those kind of features um, or angles or resolutions. So I maybe change this in the measurement device and get better data for it to make a better machine learning model. And perhaps best understood, you can imagine this interactive access when you have this data stream now actually simulating this galaxy here based on, of course, um, you know, known physical laws on this on gravity, but then numerical methods over time and time steps. So every time step we get here an update of this visualization and the positioning of stars and this black hole in the middle. And now you start in actually changing the orientation of stars or you play with the black hole. You're actually moving the black hole around basically this visualization, which makes it then an interactive visualization, because, of course, the location of that has been now as a particle position be put back to the HPC system. And then it provides an updated simulations on the gravity on the stars. So this is a big topic, this real time analytics. We talk in the HPC course also a bit more about this particular, also about this particular simulation we have here just to show you how these data streams are interesting and have different challenges really in, in all different sorts of respects. So a good usage example we had a bit earlier in the course already where we talked about the Spark streaming. So Spark is a very good core, as we know, it's deployed everywhere in the clouds. So we can immediately use it for free with Spark to streaming. It's an open source tool. Of course, you pay the infrastructure around it with MS Azure, you know, basically then paying the hardy insight. But still, um, you would have a tool which enables you very quick with a couple of lines of codes, very powerful ideas. 
here was the idea, you know, of basically looking at a Twitter channel on all the, you know, content that mentions Spark, but it could be your product that actually basically your company is interested in to check. So in, with just a couple of lines from the streaming API, you can actually count the, you know, the uh, elements, how many of those are. And then we know also, of course, with, um, you know, things like, you know, the things we learned with map reduce and word count, this can inform a lot of elements in your application. Perhaps also in advertising, marketing, what keywords go alongside. And the interesting thing is that those APIs are also then very fault tolerant. So they can deal with node crashes in times, which is very important to consider. So, um, of course, when a stream is failing here and there, you want to carry on. The stream is constantly getting data out. So if you have a measurement device, it just doesn't stop just because your software is crashed or your node for in in analyzing it is crashed. So you quickly have to go up to speed. And as we learned, Apache Spark had this fault tolerance mechanism, which is quite interesting here. And it also enables you, of course, to do basically interactive queries and filters that we have just conceptually discussed. So very powerful tool. You can deploy it as an example, as we know from previous lecture, the MS Azure Cloud. Um, I think that's pretty clear by now. You can deploy it in the EMR, in the Elastic MapReduce Hadoop environment, which supports Spark. And with this, automatically the Spark streaming API. Now, coming a little bit to a, let's say, very specific service in the AWS world. Here we're talking again about real-time analytics, and it's a specific service called Amazon Kinesis. And you see they have many services here for the analysis of uh, data streams for data itself. But this is perhaps a little bit very specific to data streams when you think about real-time analytics. So that's why it's maybe very good to go shortly into this. And it, it of course, is used for, for many different purposes. Netflix is using it, for instance, to, to actually just look at all the communication streams um, which comes in and basically fix lots of issues and problems where it's basically um, saying that, well, my my... Netflix movie is not coming up, although I paid for it. My bandwidth should be okay. My router should be okay. What's the problem? So this is something where lots of these streams from constantly users complaining, perhaps also praising products, is of course a very good application scenario. Netflix is just beautiful on it. If you can imagine that has many, many users, many, many content, and here you can comment and uh, you know, using this kind of data stream really to um, think about it. Um, a very usual way of using it would be also if you think about you are a company and where Amazon Kinesis is quite good is to link in different data sources here. You see the input could be social media streams into this from Facebook, from Twitter, from YouTube, from Instagram, from whatever it is, and bring that all together, all these different data streams which is basically part of this Kinesis idea, and then do this so-called Kinesis data analysis on top, which then can do basically really work on the data set um, in real time. And then of course, there are different services what you can use afterwards, like this AWS Lambda for post-processing and so on to write it really in a proper database to understand your stream and in a way to transform the stream to some proper output which is perhaps not any more directly a stream, but a proper output in some point in time. As this is basically theoretically never stopping, you here would be basically transforming it in a world which is a bit stopping in terms of new data. But of course, you think about that this pipeline here, what you really have, it's a pipeline in sorts of steps is constantly executed and creating new output all the time. And there are different application and use case scenarios. Um, Netflix with video streams, data streams, uh, and so on is, of course, a big good example of this, but could be also measurement devices. It could be video streams, right? Think about you have your own security camera in the company with all the access um, that you basically have there. And then you want to analyze those different video streams. Um, do you want to do recognition of, you know, people? Do you want to have recognition of malicious behavior? Do you want to perhaps also think about um, 
that maybe some of your products, when you make videos in the pipeline, when you're constructing it, have manufacturing errors. So all of these different elements could be actually used in order to essentially then enable, you know, to handle the streams, to really work with it. And this is where Kinesis and AWS is very strong in to really think about, um, you know, working with the streams, particularly focused here on videos, um, to really index the content, to have real-time batch analysis on this content that it couldn't be used for, you know, basically different deep learning networks or the SageMaker we already had and so forth. And of course, this could be different scenarios. You see here um, the the idea of how it would be working in a parking lot these days. If you go to some of those um, at airports these days, for instance, Cologne or so, uh, you would have basically automatic your, your, your license plate coming in. It would be registered directly to your basically all the different video streams that's coming out all looking on this plate. And then essentially with this matching of the license plate, um, you can basically open directly, uh, again, directly basically open the doors of the parking places. So that's one, just one good example of it. You can see it, of course, in different areas. When you want to protect your home, you can also have cameras detecting the license plate if there's someone coming on your large, um, you know, basically area of your home, whatever it is. The security camera business would be one idea of thinking about it. But of course, um, with stream of data, you can think about many ways where cameras are used today, even in science, when you think about that we have cameras in oceans or so to really understand more scientific behavior. But here, Amazon Kinesis gives you already everything. But of course, you know the business. You have to swipe the credit card for it uh, to really use it. However, of course, to implement all of this and to make it scalable, to make it reliable, to make it fault tolerant, as we discussed, um, this would require lots of time if you want to do it yourself. So basically here you have a very, let's say, grown service uh, that works perfectly, um, I would say. And with this, of course, um, gives you an interesting incentive to use this service if you can maybe roll it out to your customers' cost and basically have an added you know, return of investment somehow coming from your service, which is, you know, using this data for some certain purpose. And here are some of them uh, basically shown again, and I think it's a bit repetition more or less. You see lots of elements could be used in after the stream, but the input could be always different, could be social media devices, input streams of, you know, things you use for your servers, logging, website tracking, it's really lots of different sources, and that's where Kinesis is good at. It could be very specialized resources if you think about the agrar situation. So basically looking uh, on tractors that today have really lots of sensors and giving data streams of all your different fields. You actually have crops with and so on. Another complete different use, but can help you also to have basically um, different elements uh, done with this. One idea is to have, let's say, replacement parts of this track earlier done. So talking about proactive maintenance of these tractors and, and many different use case scenarios. So I think I'm repeating myself here. Fire horse is a little bit um, basically um, a preparation kind of data. And I want to just show you here that basically in New York City, this is a, a, a very big media an information company which is here existing and they're really using this uh, daily and have done a very nice quote here that you see um, data streams and files make the entire process extremely simple which is another part of this as a SaaS service more or less you want to have it very you know specific perhaps but easy but you know people like here that are doing this media and you can imagine they're expert in their world, in their media world. They don't want to be expert in cloud computing. They just want to use the services, put maybe some things into storage that what they understand, and then put Kinesis to it. And then we can maybe do some interesting things with it, like Elasticsearch or so, do some analytics and so forth. So in a way, I think that's given with the Kinesis, um, let's say, service portfolio in the Amazon Web Service. But here, of course, there would be also a, a big way of really understanding this with some kind of certifications. 
more towards the end, let's say there are lots of open source tools which are enable, you know, very similar behavior, but there are, you're on your own. You have to deploy it yourself. You have Apache Flume that's actually an open source tool to look at data streams. Could be basically from all the social media websites. And it works with so-called sources and things and a channel actually that can be defined in order to find so-called flumed events. And here you are able to look at this, let's say, example of the Facebook streams, which would be then written maybe in HDFS, but with so-called interceptors, which a little bit are now like the filter that we discussed. We can, you know, implement certain types of behavior to look on all these streams and say, I'm just interested in my Facebook sources today, not Twitter, and would basically define interceptors for that. And there are many different other usage scenarios if you think about different products, not social media streams, but also product content. Now, Apache Storm is a more, more recent term, uh, tool also that is looking on this. It's basically also part of the open source service portfolio that you basically is um, using data streams to work with. It, it supports many different um, programming languages and basically Storm runs more kind of topology, you know, jobs um, compared to maybe previous approaches that we have seen on Spark and uh, Hadoop, where you have always this kind of, you know, linked behavior in the stream. And, and this is something where, again, you probably need a complete lecture to understand this, but it's, of course, a very interesting thing to, to characterize perhaps this as a data streaming entity. And then Apache Flink um, is basically something what we already know from Spark a little bit. So really, what can I get out really of thinking about in-memory processing? We know that it's very quick. And this is really the selling proposition of Apache Flink being very strong essentially in this idea of using memory uh, in practice with all this kind of data streams. But I mean, many of these open source projects then of course are open source, you have to deploy it your own, you have to work on this. And in many cases you start then suddenly of having to realize it's a big workflow I'm dealing with. That's why basically you work with maybe other components in the world like Kafka, which is more a brokering tool and, and really dealing with all of these different sources maybe of information where you have a little bit the idea of kinesis again. So really work with data fusion as we call it in machine learners and bringing really, really distributed streaming sources again into it. Here's an interesting exam between Storm and Flink. You can imagine that essentially here, um, Storm is, is actually interesting to see what are the throughput here. It's not about the speed up here, it's the throughput. So how many items can be looked at with the number of cores? And you see Flink can do much, much more than Storm because it leverages this in memory computing. And Kafka and all of these open source tools would be really something which carries content of another complete lecture at least. And with this, um, we basically would say um, this is content of some other, let's say, open source lecture series or certification process you should look at. Finally, more or less the online learning approach in machine learning. Um, here you have this kind of idea that this data um, comes continuously. You shop it maybe into different pieces, train online this machine level learning mechanisms, and then you evaluate it, analyze it, and maybe change it with the constant stream coming in. And the batch learning is much different. It's basically static data. You train your machine learning up, uh, machine learning, then evaluate the solution, and then basically you update maybe the existing data set, but it's not, let's say, the constant stream of data coming in. And that's what is characterizing online learning usually. Also, this is a big field to study. Online learning is, of course, still a research idea, but of course, very interesting to think about because also there you could be real-time insights directly. And then, of course, having to use the power of machine learning on top of this in real time, having actually models trained directly informing decision makers or, let's say, your company bosses about certain effects in the data or, you know, outliers and, and so forth. I have another video which is quite interesting, um, which is actually the, light, the last video of this course. It mentioned also Iceland for the measurement. So here's EPOS. A key 
feature of environmental science is integration. So what is EPOS? EPOS uh, is a long-term integration plan. Air science research allows the understanding of the physical processes controlling earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, unrest episodes and tsunamis. EPOS is integrating existing research infrastructures and facilities. The key challenge is to open up the enormous wealth of available multidisciplinary data and promote cross-disciplinary science serving society. EPOS can apply to different use cases. enable a step change in multidisciplinary scientific research and public outreach for earth sciences. So I think you have also seen data from all the seismic devices. Also, the data we provide now with the new volcano that we have in Iceland is tremendous, um, alone from the satellite images that have been taken um, on a daily basis, actually. But also in older times, this was, of course, very interesting, also part of EPOS. And you see also in the end, it's also humans that need to analyze this data, but they need the infrastructures. And for this cloud computing, dealing with big data is just really good at. 
that's all for the lecture today. And essentially, we have covered all materials of the courses now. As I said earlier, the short lectures were more or less pointers for you for more study material, for important study material based on this cloud computing course content. We stop here and we'll be coming back to Epilogue uh, Lecture 16, really, to just reviewing a little bit on jobs in this areas, reflecting the course material in this job descriptions, and then a little bit of an overview of what topics we have tover covered and what topics would be also similar to study. So see you next time.